It's now recorded. So this is the one. Okay. Okay, then you can hold. done. Then when you get over to your seat, just do the zoom and we're ready to go. Okay. Okay, let's keep going here. Uh, Pastor Ken's going to be a little late, so we ask you to get things started. Thank you. And uh, welcome to Bible study. Uh, Good evening. Let's oh, start. Thank you, Lord, for the day. Thank you for your blessings. Thank you that we can uh, open your word and stuff. And just a little bit of to uh, the work you have for us. In your name we pray. Yeah. Okay, we're going to continue in Daniel, chapter 11. But um, Pastor Ken asked me to go over one of the most infamous characters in the Bible, uh, Antiochus Epiphanes. So we're going to uh, look at his character and the Antichrist. So let's see. Kathy, could you read Daniel 8, 3 through 9? Mm -hmm. Daniel 8, what? 3 through 9. I looked up and there before me was a ram with two horns standing beside the canal, and the horns were long. One of the horns was longer than the other, but grew up later. I watched the ram as he charged toward the west and the north and the south. No animal could stand against him. None could rescue him from his power. He did as he pleased, and he became great. And as I was thinking about this, suddenly a goat with a prominent horn between his eyes came from the west, crossing the whole earth without touching the ground. He came toward the two-horned ram. I had seen standing beside the canal and charged at him in a great rage. I saw him attack the ram furiously, striking the ram and shattering his two horns. The ram was powerless to stand against him. The goat knocked him to the ground and trampled on him, and none could rescue the ram from his power. The goat became very great, but at the height of his power, his large horn was broken off, and in its place, four predominant horns grew up toward the four winds of heaven. One more verse. Oh. Out of one of them came another horn, which, which started a small, but grew in the power to the south and to the east and toward the beautiful land. Okay, so let's see what everybody remembers. Eight three. The ram. What's the ram? Now keep in mind, this is 600 BC. Anybody know what the ram is? Two horns. The head. Sounds like Satan. No. What is it? Oh, um, Medo Persians? Or? Yes, that's the Medo Persian Empire. Okay. And that's the empire that was. Yeah, that's what I'm looking for. Oh, my last hand out. Mm -hmm. That's the empire that Daniel was living in, the Medo Persian Empire. So those were the two, the Medes and the Persians are the two courts. And they ruled at that time. And they ruled for quite a few more years after Daniel died. And then all of a sudden there was this goat with one prominent horn. And he guesses who the goat is a unicorn. <laughs> Greece? The grapes? Yes, that's Greece. Okay. And a little fact um, the name Greece didn't come about until centuries later. They didn't call them the Greeks. No. But it was, it did represent Greece. And what was the horn? Or who was the horn, I should say? Oh, they're. Uh... Who was their conqueror? Alexander. Oh, yeah. Alexander the Great. So Alexander and his sense <clears throat> how it came in and it just crossed the whole earth without touching the ground, just blew through. And that's how Alexander conquered the world at the time. He just came in, took his armies, and just blew through and destroyed everybody. He took over. Now, and all of a sudden, and now this is about 
It's after 200 BC, I think maybe around 180, 190 or something like that. Alexander died all of a sudden. And he had sons, but they didn't take over. There were four generals that took over the Greek Empire. One to the north, one to the south, which is like Egypt, one to the east, which was in the Orient, and one to the west, which was toward Rome and Europe. And um, those four, and that's what they show here, the four winds, north, south, east, and west. And um, so that's the four horns that they're talking about in verse, let's say, yeah, four prominent horns. Those were the four generals, the four winds, the four directions. And then verse 9, out of one of them came another horn, started small, and grew to great power. That is the guy we know as Antiochus Epiphanes. And um, he wasn't right after Alexander. It was a few generations later. There were other generals. He actually was Antiochus IV. And he very presumptuously took the name in Epiphanes, which means God manifest. So he thought he was God. And he acted like it too. And he actually reigned from 175 to 164 BC. And he turned out to be the most brutal of the uh, Greek rulers. So, what was that's that name again? What's that? What was this, this, name? this one right here? Antiochus Epiphanes. Okay. Ah, oh, there you go. That's, okay. So, we're not going to go over that sheet, but that just. just You'll see where we're going with that yeah. a little later. So we'll follow on along. The right side shows you a little bit about him. Mm -hmm. I think okay. the right side. Yeah. 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 Thank you. I had the Antichrist in the left. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Do you need one? No, I got one right here. Oh, okay. <laughs> Just my notes are very good. This can be very confusing. And this guy was a really bad guy. The way he got to power, I, I think Pastor Ken was talking about it. Um, intermarrying and merging and killing people and going in and he was just a really bad guy. But he was also very deceitful. He didn't go in and overpower people. And we all know who can be very deceitful, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, in, uh, let's turn to uh, verse 23 in chapter 8. And, um, Ron, could you read 23 to 26? <clears throat> Chapter 8. Chapter 8, yes. 23. When the end of these kingdoms is near and they have become so wicked that they must be punished, there will be a stubborn, vicious, and deceitful king. 24. He will grow strong, but not by his own power. He will cause trouble, destruction, and be successful in everything that he does. You have been destruction on powerful men and on God's own people. 25. Because he is cunning, he will succeed in his deceitful ways. He will be proud of himself and destroy, destroy many people without warning. He will even defy the greatest king of all, but he will be destroyed without the use of any human power. Did you like 26. 26. Okay. 26. This vision about the evening and morning sacrifices, which has been explained to you, will come true. But keep it a secret now, because it will be a long time before it does come true. Okay, so this is what's called a dual prophecy. Because it's prophesying what's going to happen in one instance, but it also prophesies something else that's going to happen as well. So this prophecy... History tells us um, came true with Antiochus Epiphanes. It also is prophesying what's going to happen in the end times with the Antichrist. You can see the parallel after we studied Revelation, all the various things. And um, that's why I had to run, go through 26. It says, seal up the vision for concerns of distant future. So what was the distant future from 600 B.C.? 
150 BC or something we haven't seen yet. Okay, now let's go back to where we left off last week in Daniel 11. Connie, can you read Daniel 11, 31 and 32? 31. Okay, some of the soldiers will make the temple ritually unclean. They will stop the daily sacrifices and set up the awful horror. By deceit, the king will win the support of those who have already abandoned their religion. But those who follow God will fight back. Wise leaders of the people. Bracket 3132. Okay, so we talked about, if you remember back in Revelation, the abomination of desolation. Well, this guy also did. He went in there, he erected, I forgot what statue it was, right in the middle of the temple and stopped all the uh, sacrifices the Jews were making. And that was just a foreshadow of the Antichrist. And there's so many things in these couple verses that just show us what we can look at history to see what happened. We can also look forward to see what's going to come. Um, anybody see anything in these two verses that kind of foreshadow the Antichrist? And people abandon their religion. Okay. Um, people give up on God. They don't fight back. They just give in to him. He says a, uh, like John Kennedy, what a, a kind of a personality that just draws people. This person just like the Antichrist will be. Okay. And also the Antichrist, is, and I know in future times his name's supposed to be, he calls himself a man. His name is a man. He calls himself a man. Well, we don't know that. He, um, in 32, it says, with flattery, he will corrupt those who violate the covenant. This guy's going to come in and try and charm people. Flattery, deceit, um, be personally persuasive. Just like this guy did back in the 2nd century B.C. That's how the Antichrist is going to come. He's not going to come in Empower and rule and destroy. He's going to come in and try and just charm the world, seduce the world. Um, of course, you know, Proverbs 31, it says, Charm is deceitful. Um, in fact, David had an experience with a charming betrayer, and he said in Psalm 55, The words of his mouth were smoother than butter, but war was in his heart. His words were softer than oil, yet they were drawn swords. That's how the Antichrist is going to take power. Okay. Um. <coughs> what else is in there? I think Anthony hit on it. It's going to corrupt and seduce those who have a covenant with God. So this guy came in and he's not saying he's going to come in and seduce those who never had a covenant with God. He's getting people to backslide. And that's what this guy did. He went in amongst the Jews and he got them to come to his side with his flattery. And again, another parallel with how the Antichrist is going to come. He's going to come and he's going to try and seduce not just the world, but he's going to try and seduce Christians with the wiles of the world. Try and make it seem so attractive and everything. And that's when we'll really know who um, puts their trust in the Lord and who doesn't. But there's a promise in there too. What's the promise in there? Anybody see it? Those who know God, know God should be will strong. firmly resist. Right? Yeah. It says the people who know God. Yeah. No. And um, who will resist him. 
Jesus said in John 17, This is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus whom you have sent. So knowing God, that's what's important. Yes? My question is, we read this, we study it, and there's a lot I don't understand, but how can the Antichrist come and change people when they know the truth? Well, I mean, we know that he's coming. Right? right. We know. That's why it's the age of deception. Right, oh, that's we why know that there's going to be somebody that's going to come here and try to make us think he's Christ coming. Oh, okay. yeah, I know what you mean now. But we know yeah. he's going to slide in and head you down. Mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> and that's, that's why you need to study. You need to know yeah. the word so that you can resist. And you need to know God so you can resist. And there are those who kind of on the fence, wishy-washy and everything, and they're going to be Surprise. open to all that. <laughs> Not me. <clears throat> okay. The other thing was, how do we know this wasn't just history? You know, there's um, there are some theologians. There are few, but unfortunately, they're persuasive in some areas. They believe that this part of Daniel wasn't written until the first century BC because it's so specific and so accurate that someone must have written it afterwards and and they just append these things to it. So how do we know that that's not true and that this isn't just talking about that period of time? Any guesses? It says he will flatter those. He didn't say he did flatter those. Okay. In 32. And it also says in chapter 8 that it's the future. But how do we know that wasn't just written that way? We don't. We just trust the Lord and put the right words in. Actually, we do. Wendy, look up uh, Matthew 24, verses 15 and 16. And then keep in mind, this is 200 years after Antiochus Epiphanes wrote. Matthew 24, 15. The time will come when you will see what the end of the prophet spoke about. The sacrilegious object that causes desecration. See me in the holy place. Reader, pay attention. 16. And those in Judea must flee to the hills. So Jesus is saying the day is coming that it's going to happen, that they'll see these things happening, that the abomination in the temple will happen. Not that it did, but that it's going to happen. So we know that these things that he's talking about, says specifically, through the prophet Daniel. So these verses are verified by Christ's words. And yes, we have to trust and obey. But it was Christ who said that. And he said it after it happened historically with Antiochus. So we know that this is also talking about the future, talking about the Antichrist. And that, that same passage is also in Mark and Luke, right by Boyd. Yeah. yeah, there used to be a show, I don't know if it's still up because I don't get cable anymore. I stopped it because of the financial work. The End Times, called The End Times. And one of the gentlemen that did it was father in law and son. He died of COVID. 
but it was the anti-Haitian symbol of the ministry. Mm -hmm. be, they talked about warning, sending pamphlets to Israel. Now, ahead of time, warning that the, when this happens, the flee, get people ready. This is months ago. Setting up a network where contact people, mail stuff out. And I would watch it every Sunday night, so I go to the Okay, so that brings us up to where we left off last week. Go ahead, Pastor Ken. I prepared the lead. Uh, any thoughts on what I've thrown out here? What you said about who wrote this in the end. Well, reading that, what we just read in Matthew, Jesus said, what Daniel said. Right. So we know that it came from God. Right? Absolutely. Okay. I just said there are Bible scholars well, that say that, but right. I don't think much of their... But if you read that after hearing that, yeah. then you know. Yeah, if you read that, how can you question yeah. that it was not part of the original? Right. Like a lawyer, I can bring up both sides. <laughs> okay. Well, while we're waiting, I just I found something that was interesting. This has nothing to do with what we're studying in Daniel, but anybody ever hear of the line in the sand? Draw a line in the sand. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. someone across it. Anybody have a clue where that came from? I'm going to find out. Couldn't find out. Came from Antiochus Epiphanes. Say that again? The king came from Antiochus Epiphanes. The Greek god. Wow. He was attacking Egypt. And the Romans sent someone to say, don't do it. For this guy, what was his name? Um, Popilius. Went to Antiochus and told him to stop. And Antiochus said, well, I got to think about it. So this guy, Pontilius, drew a circle around Antiochus in the sand and said, decide what you're going to do, and then cross the line. And if you attack, you're dead. Not much choice, was there? That's where the phrase, draw a line in the sand, comes from. I just thought that was interesting. That's yeah. Anyway, okay. oh. Next week. Where did we leave off last week? Did we finish a lot of it? Anybody remember where we left off last week? Uh, 30, uh, yeah, we were. 36 to 45, and then chapter That's over. Five. Okay. Yes. And why don't we go ahead? And um, I didn't want to prepare this stuff. Okay. Uh, let's go around and starting with 36, let's each read the verse. Start with Kathy. Um, Daniel 11, 36. The king will do as he pleases. He will exalt and magnify himself above every god, and he will say unheard of things against the god of gods. He will be successful until the time of wrath is completed, for what has determined must take place. All right. The king will ignore the god his ancestors served, and also the god that woman loved. In fact, he will ignore every god, because he will think he is greater than any of them. 38. Instead, he will honor the God who protects luxuries. He will offer gold, silver, jewels, and other rich gifts to a God of his ancestors never worship. 39. Thus shall he do in the most stronghold with a strange God, whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory. And he shall cause them to rule over many, and shall divide the land for many. 40. Then at the time of the end, the king of the south will attack him. The king of the north will storm out against him with 
of chariots, cavalry, and vast navy. He will invade various lands and sweep through them like a flood. 41. He will also invade the beautiful land. Many countries will fall, but Edom, Adam, Moab, and the leaders of Ammon will be delivered from his hand. 42. Then he will stretch out his hand against other countries, and the land of Egypt will not escape. We're going to pass. I forgot the verse. Oh. You guys are right. better anyway. 43, Diane. 43. 43. He shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver and over all the precious things of Egypt. Also, the Libyans and Ethiopians shall follow at his heels. Okay, I'll read the last two. Yeah. A report from the east and the north will alarm him. He will set out in great rage to destroy and annihilate many. He will pitch his royal tents between the seas at the beautiful holy mountain. Yet he will come to his end, and no one will help him. Okay, take a minute, go over the verse you read. And so in many ways, this again is one of those dual prophecies. It's talking about what's going to happen 400 years later. It's also talking about, in many ways, the Antichrist. Okay, Kathy. 36. Thoughts? Well, he's going he's gonna to do whatever he wants, and he doesn't care about anything else except himself. Sounds kind of narcissistic to me. And that, that's it. He only cares about himself. He doesn't care about any, all he cares about is success and no, nobody else except himself. Putting, him, putting himself above everybody, including God. Which makes perfect sense with the title he called himself, Epiphanies. Mm -hmm. So, uh, he actually felt he was God. Little G God. Oh, you didn't have to do that. That's right. Little G. Finally, let's begin. Finally, you have the next verse. The word of God is Jesus is true. It's also the God that will be loved. He will ignore every God because he thinks he's greater than any of us. Yeah, he thinks that he is, he is the main God. He is God. He's above everything else. He is God. And he's it. And again, that just what we've learned of how the Antichrist will be when he takes charge of the world. And hopefully, we won't be here for. Um, Prayerfully, we won't be here. Yeah. Maybe Putin's here. He might be here right now. In fact, Dave Baxter was the name of that person with the end time show. Irvin Baxter. Baxter. Creepy anymore. Right. Oh, I was getting a oh, is it verse 38 verse? instead of them here. 38. Mm -hmm. Oh, what I read. What you read, yes. God of the gods who will protect the fortress and to offer the gold. <clears throat> well, that's right. Um, he was offering friends that, uh, you know, big jewels and gold and everything else that he had in his possession. And uh, also, uh, his ancestors, uh, it says here about him, had never worshipped. So he created, in essence, his own. This is how he came in. Yes. Antiochus came in and he flattered them, deceived them, gave them gifts, anything he could do to get them on his side. And uh, kind of what the earth has to look forward to sometime in the future, too. You know, everybody thinks the Antichrist is going to come in with a heavy hand and everything. Mm -hmm. He 
he's not. He's gonna, he's gonna be this charming world leader who just all of a sudden, all of a sudden pops into prominence. I don't think we'll have any clue. Um, probably someone who negotiates a treaty with Israel. And, uh, comes Pastor again. Okay. Okay, so, uh, Stephanie, you have the next verse? Yeah, and it looks like, you know, he's. You're right. Where are you on? Not in the back, okay. And he's had an worship, so I'm sorry that he's that. And he's uh, going to glory and increase your money and make them rich and make them strong. And they follow. And they follow. And if you're going to go north, south, east, and west, you just want to do it. And um, <clears throat> this guy was actually part of the kingdom of the north. And uh, he did battle in this instance with the kingdom of the south, which would be, even though he was told not to, remember? I, the line in the sand. Okay, Wendy, you had 41? 40. 40. Okay. The, the king of the south could attack him. And then the king of the north who was killed out against him. The chariots, cavalry, and the past being, you know, invade the various leaves and sweep through them like a flood. He said, it's just going to, it's going to be a holy havoc. <laughs> and this won't be the first time he's tried it. If go back a few verses. He actually tried it and lost. He's not going to give up. He, he, he's God. he went back and he bribed all his people and got his armies together, and now he's going in and cutting yep, everybody down. He's coming me. Here, here's some jewelry for you and some. Whatever you want. Uh, 41. Anthony. 41, it talks about him invading the beautiful land and the country's falling. Um, and, and he says about, I guess, Adam Moab and the leaders of Angam will be delivered from his hand. So I guess he's going to be turning them over to, to someone. It's, it's, you know, is that what he's doing? You're the history person. Yeah, I'm just trying to figure that one out. You know, is he, is, what do you want? Is he turning over the land to someone else to rule? It's kind of interesting to me that, that these countries, Edom and Moab, are down to the uh, southeast of the Dead Sea. Um, Mine says rescued. Rescued. Saved. Okay. Action seems to be in the north and the south and to the west. But uh, these lands, uh, and you would think they would fit into Arab and Muslim lands today. That I can't quite get to handle what's going on here with them. Why they're defined in this way. Special. What's said about that? Thank you. Yes. Oh, Peter, you said yours says rescued. rescued, like they were special. Saved. Saved. Yeah, mine says be delivered from his hand. Mine says it will escape. Maybe, maybe because they're in league with him? Uh, I'm curious who would deliver. I'm saying. Yeah. Him. So I, I question mm. what exactly is going on here. Okay. Peter, yes. okay. you had 42? Yes. No, it is the shortest verse of all. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can let you talk about 43 as well. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> but 
but it also it says that um, he's going to be, I guess he's going to conquer like Alexander. He's, he's going to go right through Egypt, and um, and you know, nobody's going to be able to stop him. So so of those four that we talked about at the beginning, these are the two that are clashing, the north and the south. So is uh, Antiochus north? Yes, he was the king of the north. And, uh, he so the Egypt is pretty far south. <laughs> How many I think? That where it was? It was the south. Actually, Egypt's not that far when you think about it. Egypt's the one that's blocking all the people from Gaza from fleeing right now. So Egypt borders on. Because they don't want them. Right. It's a man. I'm just saying that's how close Egypt is. It borders what people refer to as Gaza. And early after 48, they actually, Gaza was under their administration. Yeah, came to a point where they didn't want to deal with them. Wow. Let's go. Okay, Diane, you had a uh, 43? Yep. Okay, he's going to have power over all the silver and gold and treasures. Sounds like he's going to take over on everyone's money. And, uh, and it says the Libyans and the Ethiopians are going to follow. So he's going to be in control of all the, all the wealth. So when he conquered Egypt, Egypt, I believe, ruled over Libyans and Ethiopians in that part of Africa. And... Um, so that was his bonus that he picked up and he just took all their riches. This guy... He's going to be in control. He controls a lot. Yeah. And it says reports from the east and the north will alarm him. East and the north. And he'll set out on a great rage to destroy and annihilate money. So what's, what is east? Any guesses? I was thinking in the Ethiopia and Libya. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, it was really... northeast. Israel? Right. Oh, that's yeah. more what? Um, Syria and Iraq and Iran. Oh. And then you go up to the east, you go up into Rome. And... North is Russia. <sighs> yeah. And if you remember when I told the story about the lion in the sand, mm. it was told to yeah. stop. But he, he, he And that came from Rome, from the east. And then 45, he'll pitch his royal tents between the sea, between seas at the beautiful holy mountain. Yet he will come to his end and no one will help him. And we know what's going to happen to the Antichrist at the end, too. Right about the same area. Okay. So do we know what happened to Antiochus other than he came to his end? Say that again. What happened to Antiochus after he conquered all this land? I have no clue. It must have all fallen apart. Too much to, too many marbles to yeah. well, you know, juggle. The Maccabees at Hanukkah is when the Maccabees had to revolt. And they were temporarily successful. And uh, because of what he'd done in the temple, uh, so that pretty much ended him and their revolt. Uh, and then after that, the Roman scheme. Yeah, I mean, that was the. That was the so he was like the last of the Greeks. Yeah. yeah. That was probably at the Romans when they came in and blew everything apart again. So again, this is not just a prophecy of history that's going to happen. Look, we see 
has already happened, but it's a prophecy of things to come. It's a very interesting chapter because there's a lot of very specific things that are mentioned. Got the future, and then things like we just talked about here, the analogy between this guy and the Antichrist. I mean, Jesus referred to this in Matthew 24, the abomination of desolation. He's talking about something different than what happened under this individual. So that's yet into the future. Uh, and obviously, many, there's many years into the future. Uh, so the analogy I mentioned last week is Matthew 24. The destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, the return of Christ, and what took place, going to take place before that in tribulations, many years in the future. Yes, there's like two different, and this is the same thing here. Um, he was told about being told about something that was going to come up in a couple hundred years versus something that still future for us. And Daniel was, you know, told that I'm being given you these prophecies about the future, but it was really like two futures in a sense, and uh, many years in between. And his response, you remember, was uh, it really uh, kind of overwhelmed him. In chapter ten, to where like he goes like three weeks of fasting and all that. He's, and this is Daniel who's had a lot of experience with visions and dreams and being able to interpret things for other people. Uh, but uh, what he was being told here, well, it's going to come up in the next couple hundred years for his people, and then even far into the future, yes, for us. Although, you look at the events of the world today, you have to say, probably not too far in the future. <laughs> you know? Uh, it's the Antichrist, and you get just, a, just the world we live in today. You got the situation in Ukraine where it's another one of European wars. I mean, we've gone 78 years without European wars, but the history of Western civilization in Europe is just wars upon wars. Uh, it's just kind of hard to believe after World War II, we've gone all those years, there's another European war going on. Uh, of course, what happened with World War I, there were all these treaties and that stuff that sucked one country into it. It became, it became a world war. Uh, and 25 years after that, because of the way that war, you know, war doesn't solve anything, really. It doesn't solve anything. And World War I is an example of that, that just created World War II. And that's World War II, we really immediately went into the Cold War the east and the west. Uh, and uh, he got that going on in Europe today. I heard the former vice president today saying, well, you know, if we don't stop Putin in Ukraine, he's going to then get going to uh, these countries that were part of the Soviet Union, not part of NATO. If he can't defeat Ukraine, a country of 40 some million, and he's got 200 some million. He's not going to take on 30 some countries that make up NATO. That's funny. I didn't think about it. I heard your politicians say that as a steer tactic. He ain't going to do that. He can't defeat Ukraine. He's not going to take on 30 countries, including the United States. Yeah, that makes sense. But uh, they're still concerned what's going on. In Ukraine, obviously. But the biggest concern is the Middle East. And uh, they still say what Hamas tried to do on October the 7th is they tried to ignite the whole Arab Muslim world to invade Israel. The West Bank, all the disturbances going on there, Hezbollah up in Lebanon, you got Iran firing missiles the whole way from Iran. Uh, you got the down in Yemen with the, uh, the with those people that are being funded uh, by Iran. 
Uh, so Israel was really circled. Really encircled. And sooner or later, what we read about in Revelation, there is going to be this huge, massive army made of all these countries and all these people. They're going to make the beautiful land. But all the trouble leading up to that, you can see how if somebody could come forward with some kind of peace plan that would kind of calm things for a time, you can you can see how that, that would be appealing. Right, right now, somebody can come forward right now with a peace plan. Oh yeah, it'd be very you know it's could be a very appealing thing. So. Uh, through his intrigue or whatever else is this person is going to gain that. But we we read the book of Revelation chapter 13 and chapter 14, we know what happens. Why couldn't they do why couldn't they do a peace plan when Bill Clinton was in office with Yasser Arafat and they gave Yasser and Arafat they gave, 98 point, they gave Yasser Arafat 98.5 percent of what he asked for, but he said, you know, if I sign this, I'm signing my own death warrant. Because it was not still would not satisfy the militant Muslim and Arab Islamic people. And that's why Yasser Arafat never slept in the same bed two nights in a row. Because he was afraid of his own people. And he said, if I, if I sign this, and I remember when he was there in 93, the big handshake, that, yeah. you know, I was part of that. That whole thing that led up to that uh, Peace process at the, at the end of the first uh, intifada, and there was that. You know, I can still see you know Rick Irvin, who was a very interesting Israeli. You talk about a no nonsense guy. He was a no nonsense person, but he was almost like forced into shaking hands mm. with with Arafat. But uh, when I was there in '96, when they blew up the buses, that's when was my wake up call one morning. Um, from the peace process in 93 to 96, in Israel, the economy and this thing just, just took off. But the raised expectations of the Palestinians and the reality was things got worse. And so you, then you had the second intifada, and uh, the, uh, that happened in 96. Then they had this other peace process, and Clinton, almost everybody who's president wants to be the president that, that solves the situation. He gets a Nobel Prize or whatever else. And I'm going to tell you, they, they offered him 98.5% of what he was looking for, and it wasn't enough. Because it, when you hear free Palestine from the river to the sea, that means no Zionist entity. That means no Israel. That's what that means. So they're never going to be satisfied. They think, they think you know history. When the Crusaders went to take the Holy Land back from the Muslims, for 200 years the Crusaders were able to capture Jerusalem and they built, they built these uh, fortresses that looked like stuff that was in Europe. And for 200 years there was a Crusader state around 10, 1100. Until Solomon was eventually able to defeat them. But the Arabs think that modern day Israel is going to be like that Christian state that was there for a period of time and then go. Except they don't read the book of Amos. The book of Amos says when they're back in the land, never again, never again will it be uprooted. That's right. <clears throat> and even though there's going to be this attempt, I believe, to invade Israel, uh, and it's going to happen. Uh, the only thing he's going to spare him is that's when Messiah comes. I said to this, the guy that was, he had actually been the chief rabbi of South Africa. He came to Israel, he was appointed to be the ambassador from Israel to the Vatican. Uh, and I actually helped sponsor him. He came to the States, he was in New Haven. Uh, brilliant guy. Just, I, mean, I wish I, he had this British accent. You know, anybody with a British accent, this sounds yeah. so intelligent. Yeah. <laughs> or authoritative. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He's speaking 50% words. And I don't talk to our group. And I still find out I get a reject line. And this guy, 
you know, I didn't want to fall asleep sitting on the front of the group. Yes. Anyway, <laughs> uh, he was a very interesting guy, but uh, I said to him one day, because I was doing a paper on messianic expectations, because uh, Orthodox Jews do believe in a mess messiah figure. You remember the story I told you about, about uh, Senator Lieberman? Mm -hmm. And when his four year old grandchild heard that Pop Pop died, and the mother said they were going there, but you're not going to see him, he said, Well, we will see him again at the resurrection in the end. Four year old Orthodox Jew. This is what Mary and Martha, they were, they, when Jesus said, You know, you're going to see him again. Oh, yeah, we understand there's going to be this resurrection. So Orthodox Jews believe that. And Orthodox Jews also believe in a messianic figure. A lot of the more liberal Jews can't believe. But they they have this peace thing. And so they're hoping for a, a period of peace. So how do you have peace without some leader? Doesn't really make sense, but that's where the appeal of this of the Antichrist. Jesus warned that there were going to be Antichrist, and then there's going to be the Antichrist. There are going to be false prophets and whatever. Uh, but um, Arafat, uh, he was he wasn't going to sign that because it, there were still people that weren't. They want to get rid of all of Israel. They won't be satisfied until the Jews are into the sea, into the ovens, and whatever else. And some of the uh, hmm. some of the comments that people are making. I mean, when people stand up and say, "I'm a loss," they're saying that they're the people that did what they did on October the seventh. When they murdered and raped and burned babies in ovens and beheaded people and all that stuff, they're saying that's what they are. That's, you know? that's what they are. And you, what we're seeing right now, uh, they're here. Yes. They're here in this country. In the colleges. Yeah. And because a lot of the uh, a lot of the Muslim Arab countries made major donations of money to MIT and the big universities. You go back and do, do some research and find out where a lot of their major money has come from. And that's how they got the professors and whatever else. Yeah. They're not dumb. They're smart. They have a plan. They have a strategy. And right now, part of this is the chaos you see going on. I mean, it's here yeah. and there. Starting Columbia and it's all over. <coughs> Uh, yeah, but uh, the um, and you listen to, you listen to these people and all the young people get duped into this stuff. You know, I mean, soon as October seventh happened, I remember saying to Debbie, I'm sitting watching the news, and I'm saying, "This is hard. This is really horrible." And you know, Israel is going to have to respond. Any country that was attacked, remember in history. When Pearl Harbor was attacked, yeah. we lost like 2,300 2, people. Mm -hmm. uh, the head of our defense department said, we didn't start this war, but we by God are going to finish it. And that's exactly what the leadership of Israel said. We didn't start this current war, but we're going to finish it. But I said, what happened is, so you heard of those horrible things that happened October the 7th, but now day in and day out for six months, you see what's happening in Gaza with those two million people and the destruction and the death. And that's what's been in the news for six months. Yeah. And people sort of tend to forget about what happened October the 7th. Mm -hmm. Well, if you know history, you know that we firebombed Dresden and German cities. We go to what Gaza looks like now, that's what those cities in Germany look like. And how did World War II end? We dropped atomic bombs on two Japanese cities. The war is a horrible thing. Yeah. I mean, I grew up in Mennonite. That's pacifist. <laughs> and so I grew up in a peace church and, and uh, wow. uh, I hate war. War is a horrible thing. It rarely solves anything. It just creates some more, more problems. But uh, this whole situation right now, you can very easily see how some antichrist figure can come along, say, I got the solution, get everybody together, there's going to be peace, and the appeal that that would be. Mm -hmm. Pastor, do you think the hostages are still alive? Many of them aren't. 
I don't think so either. I don't think many of them are. I think some of them probably died in some of the uh, bombardments and things. Some of them were carried off dead. Mm -hmm. dead. Uh, but some of them still are. But who knows what couples and what places they are. And I can understand the Israeli people that their people have been kicked, posses, and their kids were made a deal some years ago. They traded one soldier for a thousand, thousand Palestinian terrorists. And that to me is, that is just not a good thing. It should be a one for one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because all you do is you put a price on everybody else's head when you deal with terrorists in that way. Capture us, and this is by the way, well, I'm not interested in going to somewhere like Mexico. You can't, you go to Mexico, you go off the reservation down there, so to speak, and some gang grabs you. Yeah. Uh, your family will be told, you know, you're going to come up with uh, some money. Yeah. And so uh, they, they grabbed those hostages. They had a reason for grabbing them. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're not satisfied with any kind of deal that Israel does try to. Have a ceasefire. Have a ceasefire, yeah, okay. You return the hostages and you stop the hostilities, there could be a heat, another ceasefire. There was a ceasefire October the 6th. There was a ceasefire October the 6th. But the world's trying to pressure Israel into something that the United States didn't deal that way with Germany and the Allies didn't deal that way with Japan. I mean, war, war is a horrible thing. And the other thing that I would say that troubles me is those two million Palestinians, about a million of our children, all they're going to remember is what happened. What happened now? Yeah. And you just you just recruited another million people that are going to be willing to wear bombs and whatever else they need to do to attack Israel. Yeah. It's just a bad situation, but... We know things are going to get worse before they get better, but better they're going to be. Sooner or later, the Lord's going to return. So anyway, I said to this rabbi, I said, what happens when Messiah, because he didn't believe in a messianic figure, what happens when Messiah comes, turns out to be Jesus Christ? <laughs> I said, I'll say, what happens when Messiah appears? I'll use a neutral term. What happens when Messiah appears, it turns out to be Jesus Christ? He said, <laughs> we'll say, sorry we missed you the first time. <laughs> <laughs> so the Jews and the Christians are going to be get together again. They okay. will. When Messiah appears, we might say, or returns. The Antichrist, the tribulation, uh, we think we're living very close to it. We're living very close to it. Anyway, chapter 12 next week, uh, we'll finish Daniel. And then I've been thinking some more. I looked over Esther today a little bit. That's a possibility. Access to the Bible, Ephesians of the Bible, a lot of things we get to study the Bible. Let everybody know Exodus. They're all E's, Kathy. Yeah, no, but doesn't everybody basically know Exodus? I mean, how many people really know the, the, the story of Esther, how she saved her people? Did you, did you cover that book here for Kathy, verse 37? Oh! Verse 37? Special homework. Yes, yeah, yeah. special homework. Special homework for one of the... By the way, I, 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 I cut her a pass. I wasn't here for verse 27. Does anybody have any... Another reading of verse 27, uh, verse 37, I have the NIV. Oh, I have the NIV. Uh, somebody read it in some other translation beside NIV, verse 37. On uh, Daniel 11? Yes. 1137. The king will ignore the God of his ancestors served and also the God that we're in love. In fact, he will ignore every god because he will think he is greater than any of them. That's the good news. I have a different version. Yeah. Uh, he shall, <clears throat> excuse me, regard neither the god of his fathers nor the desire of women, nor regard any god. 
I read one commentary that said <coughs> could possibly be somebody who had a Hebrew background hmm. from that verse. Why? There was no regard from the God of his fathers. So that was one verse. And then, uh, what do you, how, how do you, it says, um, neither the God of his fathers nor the desire of women. So what do you call somebody that does not desire women? Could be homosexual. Possibility. Or just, you know, a single. Okay. For it's, And then it says, for he shall exalt himself above them all. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But... Um, The other is they are being judged and desired by women in some state. Well, that's, uh, you know, think of all the women that uh, were followers of Jesus. And they were there to cross and they were there to do. Mother's Day sermon coming up. I says, with God be loved of women. Yeah, God be loved by women. Yeah. So next week, chapter 12, we will finish up again. So I want you to be praying. Please pray. Be praying for May the 5th. Mm-hmm. I can tell you, you know, minister for 50 some years. Sometimes some stuff happens that I just have to say it comes from the evil one. And anybody that's been in the ministry long enough who would verify what I'm talking about. So when you pray for God's brother for protection. Uh, because believe me, the devil does not want us to have a very successful day that day. Successful, I mean, seriously blessed. He doesn't bother the dead churches or the churches got nothing going on. He doesn't bother the churches. No, no. Sue Shields. Oh, at the bank. Yeah. And <coughs> Sue was a, she was not the typical bean counter. I, I, you know, a lot of times bean counters are like, they just are very numbers people. And they're not people person, they don't have a vision about things, but Sue is not a different <laughs> bean counter. Uh, and our young man is taking over, uh, who is the executive uh, vice president, going to be the next CEO, Santiago. So we're going to having a woman, to now having a Hispanic. So this is the different world we live in, but it's still the Milford Bank that supports everything and moves, everything and moves in town. Um, Heavenly Father, we give thanks for uh, your word that you revealed yourself to Daniel, even though it's uh, some very troublesome things here that perplexed him as he's trying to figure out these things, even we're trying to figure them out. But as we look at the events of the world today, uh, it's a little easier for us to picture these things than uh, what it was for Daniel 2,500 years ago. We ask your blessing upon uh, this church, uh, special celebration coming up on the 5th, but more importantly for this church to remain a, a lighthouse down here on the west shore of Milford, going back to 1895, a vision of uh, Dr. Lawyer and Minister who went to have a Protestant place of worship, place to hold forth your word. And uh, we just pray that indeed we would remain faithful to you and your word until indeed. Uh, you return. Uh, we ask prayer for those who are uh, struggling with health issues. We think of Bev and Kaylor. We think of uh, uh, Joe at home, Will, and uh, a host of others. We just have a lot of some people dealing with some physical situations. Uh, I do pray for my mother in law in Virginia. Uh, pray for Francis that she would uh, have healing and be able to get back home, have some mobility, and freedom from pain. We remember um, Cassie also, she um, deals with different physical things. And also um, a family friend of ours, uh, her name's Pam. She's in a nursing home and had a stroke. We pray for her. And of course, we remember all of um, those that aren't here tonight. Um, We think of um, Matthew and Beatrice and um, others as well. Pray um, uh, be with each one. And also be with all of our families and our children uh, for protection and uh, to be uh, seeking you, God.
The Heavenly Father, we just ask that extra protection of the minister and his family in this church, Lord. Just find the devil that he's put in as far away as you wish and bring on any additional angels and guardians uh, that you see fit. And we just give you thanks and praise in your name and we ask this in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. We do pray for the fifth, Lord. We pray your hand. We pray no weapon prosper against our church, but anything come in one way, flee seven ways. We ask for your Holy Spirit, Lord, to uh, fill each one of us and to fill our church building. And uh, we ask for your presence, God, that you would be here and just do your work. Be free to do what it is that, that uh, pleases you. Lord, we ask your blessing upon us tonight to have a good night of rest and the week's uh, end. And get us again as a note of joy and thanksgiving on Sunday as we celebrate every Sunday the Risen Christ. Looking forward to uh, his return. But in the meantime, help us to be watching and working and building up faith in the kingdom. And we pray for us in this way. In Christ's name. Amen. 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 If you haven't signed up for the men's breakfast,